Hello everyone, welcome to the linear elasticity class. In this video, we're gonna, uh, I'm just gonna give you like a quick review and summary of the main governing equation that we already covered in this course so far. Then I'm gonna show you how we can use these equations and to solve some of the uh, most common types of problem that we would experience in the different engineering applications. And the focus is gonna be on the dimension that would be, uh, or the problem that can be classified as one-dimensional problems, as I'm going to show you. So this is the main objective of this uh, video. And I'm going to start with the governing equations. And I'm going to just like a quick review of the main equation that we already covered in this, for, in this course. So generally speaking, we said that if we do have any continuum body like this one, and this object that is for somehow it is subjected to some body forces, we said that this body forces, which is F, it is a vector force that as we defined it before and this body force it would represent any any internal forces generated or acting on the particle located inside the core of the particle but plus in addition to these forces we may definitely do have some external forces which are the t where t this stands for the for the force external force vector uh, acting on the particle located over the surface of the continuum. And if we choose any particle, like just a single particle within this continuum body, and this particle, it represents a, a point according to the classical theory of mechanics that we're already uh, using in this course, this particle definitely is going to move with a displacement as you. So you, this is the uh, degree, the, the degree of freedom that this particle would exhibit under the condition of the classical uh, mechanics. So what I'm gonna do, let us write the equations, the main essential equation that we already discussed in the course so far, but in the vector form, then I'm gonna show you these equations, but in the index notation. So starting with the degree of freedom, with the degree of freedom. Let me use a, diff a different color, like <clears throat> starting with the degrees, of freedom so the degrees of freedom according to the classical mechanics we said that any particle it will just move with a displacement u so you u it's going to be this is in the vector notation we're going to work in the vector notation u is going to be like the delta i u i this is the index notation form but this is the vector notation so instead of just adding the vector form here or symbol you should understand that this is just a vector so this is in in terms of the governing equations in the vector vector notation sense so this is for the degree of freedom and we said that for any continuum according to the classical mechanics the number of degrees of freedom are only three degrees of freedom that describe the displacement along x y and z of any continuum if we we're already working in the rectangular coordinates or even if we we're working in the cylindrical or spherical coordinate we do have still three degrees of freedom like displacement along r which is the radial direction theta and z in the cylindrical or r theta and phi in the spherical coordinates then also we said that we discussed the kinematical variables and these kinematical variables that describe how the way by which this continuum body is going to deform. So these kinematical variables, the main essential variable according to the classical mechanics is the strain field. This is the strain field. And we said that this is strain field, or we defined before a deformation field, but this deformation field describes both the rotation, the rigid body rotation of the continuum plus the strain field. And we said that the thing that would contribute to the deformation of the material, or it would be considered in the classical elasticity, is the strain field itself. And we defined epsilon, which is the strain field in the index notation and the vector notation as in this form as one over two, the nabla, which is the gradient operator times u, which is the displacement field plus the u times the nabla, which is the gradient operator, or you can use like nabla u transpose on the other side here. And we said that this component, this is strain, it is a tensor, this is second order tensor, this is direct, which is a second order second order tensor and we said that this tensor it consists of six components of the strain components of a strain 
And we said that three of these strain components are normal strain and three others are shear strain, which in case that we uh, do have two different indices for the I and J index of this epsilon. In addition to these canonical variables, we discussed the equations of motion, which are the equations of motion. And we said that for the static case, for the static scenario, we're going to call this one as the static equilibrium or the equilibrium equations. In case that this object is not moving or stationary, and this is what we mainly going to depend on through this course. Uh, so the equation of, of motion in the vector form is going to be the nabla dot sigma, this is the dot product, plus the f, which is the body force vector, plus the equal the row u double dot, where this u it should be vector, f is a vector, this sigma is a tensor, nabla, it is the uh, the gradient operator, it is a vector, but this sum, this this dot product is going to give us a vector. So we're going to end up with three equations. These are three equations, equations of motion according to the classical elasticity, like the in these three equations, like we do have one equation for the displacement of one particle that belongs to the continuum along x-axis, another equation along y-axis and z-axis. These are the three equations. In addition to these equations, we discussed the strain energy density function, the strain energy, energy density function, which is a scalar value or a scalar field, which we use to refer to this one as W or U. Uh, this is strain energy density function, we can give it like the name W equals, we can write this one in the vector form as the 1 over 2, the multiplication of the double dot product of sigma times epsilon, where sigma, this is the strain, the stress tensor, and epsilon, this is the strain tensor, so we can end up with the strain, this definitely is going to be scalar quantity, this is scalar, scalar quantity. is a scalar quantity. Make sense? So this is for the strain energy density function. Also, we discussed the constitutive equations. Equations. And we said that this constitutive equation, this is what relates the stress to the strain, which commonly known as the, from the mechanics of material class, these are the stress strain relation. We can write this th these constitutive equations into this form in the vector notation. Where sigma, this is a stress tensor, this is second order tensor. This sigma it is a second order tensor, like the epsilon. Both sigma and epsilon are second order tensor, but this one is fourth order. This is fourth order, fourth order tensor. This is in the uh, in the vector notation of the constitutive equation and something that you should understand about this constitutive equation, especially the C, we define the Cijk in L, which is in terms of the index form as lambda times the delta Ij, delta Kl, which are delta, this is the chronicle delta, and uh, the mu it is uh, plus mu delta Ik, delta Jl plus the mu of del, uh, delta i l delta j k so this is the form for a linear elastic material this is the the stress the, this is the stiffness matrix this is the material stiffness matrix or tensor this tensor this is for the case that we do have for linear linear elastic elastic isotropic material isotropic Material and this is the case that we gonna mainly depend on through this course that we gonna assume all the time that we have linear elastic isotropic material since the course is already linear elasticity. And the last equation that would be included in this governing equation is the boundary condition. So we're gonna have here another equation here, which is the boundary, the boundary conditions. So what, what does it mean, the boundary condition? And we're going to discuss these boundary conditions with more detail through this video. What I mean by the boundary condition, I'm talking about what's going to happen to the particles located over the surface of this continuum. Are they going to subject it to some forces? So what is the nature and the type of this force? Is it a force? Is it a moment? 
Uh, also, how about the displacement, possible displacements of these points, of these particles located over the surface? These are related to the boundary conditions. And we need to, these boundary conditions, we, we should have an idea about these boundary conditions in order to solve the uh, problem for linear elastic, elasticity problem, as I'm going to show you through this video. But something that we discussed before regarding the boundary condition, which is these surface tractions, like these surface tractions, how, how it would be related to the stress. And this is one of the things that we already discussed here. This mainly related to the boundary condition of the continuum. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna give you the expression for the boundary conditions for linear elasticity. Then I'm, we gonna explain these things with more detail. But this is one of the form that we discussed. This is the unit normal vector and the sigma time uh, dot product sigma. This is gonna give us t. Where t this is the surface traction. This is the stress tensor. This is just a vector. But and this n is a vector. This is the tensor and this is the dot product of the sigma times n or n times uh, sigma. Or this is this this one type of, or one form uh, of the boundary condition. Another form that we may have u itself. It is equal to u bar. Where this u bar this these are like prescribed. This is like prescribed scribe displacement displacement on the boundary. So this is like prescribed displacement on the on the boundary. Boundary, I mean by the boundary here, I mean the surface of the of the continuum body. And this this type of boundary condition is commonly known as the essential. Essential is known as the essential boundary conditions. And we're gonna discuss these things. Also this is known as the natural boundary boundary conditions. Boundary conditions. And again we're gonna give more details about these boundary conditions. But the boundary condition is one of the things that should be considered in the list of the governing equations. All of these equations that we try to demonstrate through this course are commonly known as the governing equation. These equations are essential that fully describe how this continuum body, how this material, under the influence of multiple forces, would be performing. What is the performance or the behavior of this material under these forces? To describe this behavior, we have to consider all of this list of equations, starting from the degrees of freedom, the kinematical variable equations of motion, the strain energy density function, the constitutive equation in addition to the boundary conditions. This governing equation, and this is one of the things that we're going to do through this video, I'm just going to show you how we can make use of this equation to solve some of the common problems that we would experience in the engineering application. We used to have some equations for these applications, but we didn't know what is the origin behind these equations. This is what we're going to drive or we're going to discuss through this part, starting from this video and the rest of the class or this course. Uh, but today we're just going to focus initially on the simplest type of the problem that we do have some type of problem that only one dimensional problems as I'm going to show you. So this is the objective of the video. And what, what I've presented here, I've presented these governing equations in the vector notation or the vector form. Now I'm just going to repeat or rewrite again the same equation, but in the index notation form. So now let us describe these governing equations, the governing governing equations, but in the index index notation. So nothing will be new. We already till now we're just doing like a review, like a summary, just collect and arrange these thoughts or these ideas that we already discussed before, but in such a way that we can make use of them in different make use of them in different applications. So starting again with the with the degrees of freedom, starting with the degrees degrees of freedom, we said that according to the classical mechanics, any particle that belongs to the continuum domain, it will exhibit a displacement as ui, which this is in the index, and i stands for x, y, or z, and z, or r, theta, and, and z, or r, theta, and phi, depends on the coordinate system uh, that we already considering. So this is for the degrees of freedom. Then we do have the kinematical variables. Variables for the classical elasticity, we do have only one variable, which is the essential one fundamental variable as kind of radical variable, which is the strain energy or the, um, I'm sorry, the strain field uh, that we already 
uh, considering in the classical elasticity. This is training, the index notation is gonna be epsilon ig. These are the components of the strain equals one over two, the ui comma j plus the uj comma i. And we said that this comma stands for like the derivative as we discussed before. Then also in addition to that, we do have the equations of motion of the particles, uh, the equation of motion that describe the motion of the particle itself. The equations of motion then will be with the form as sigma j i comma j plus the f i equal rho u i double dot. This is the form of the equation of motion in the index notation. In addition to that, we do have the strain energy, the strain energy density function, the strain energy density function, which is W. This W in the index notation is going to be with this form uh, equals the 1 over 2 sigma ij times epsilon ij with the sigma ij and epsilon ij. These are symmetrical tensors. Or we can substitute for sigma in, in for the constitutive equation as cij kl times the epsilon kl times the uh, epsilon ij. Or you can switch like epsilon ij or epsilon times epsilon kl it doesn't matter anyway this is a scalar quantity and we can for the case of linear elastic material for linear elastic material this is in general for any uh, isotropic or anisotropic material and the material is linear elastic this is based on linear elasticity but for isotropic linear elastic material this w is going to be with this form and this is the form that we're going to use is 1 over 2 lambda, which is the the first lemma constant, uh, constant, and this is the epsilon ii, epsilon jj, plus the mu of epsilon times epsilon uh, epsilon uh, ij times epsilon ji. And you should understand that epsilon ij, epsilon ji, both are equal uh, because this is like a symmetrical tensor as we discussed before. So this is for the case of isotropic linear elastic material, and this is the form that we're going to use. This is for isotropic, isotropic linear elastic material, material. But you should understand that this expression as well, this is also for linear elastic material, but this form, it, it is kind of a general form for a linear and nonlinear material kind of. So this is for the strain energy density function. Also, we do have the constitutive equation, the constitutive equations which can be written in this form as sigma ij equal the lambda epsilon rr or epsilon kk any double index dummy index epsilon I, uh, delta ij which is the chronicle delta plus two mu epsilon ij this is going to give us the strain uh, the the, stre the stress in terms of the strain components or the constitutive equations in the index notation then the last thing is the boundary conditions the boundary conditions, we said that we do have natural boundary conditions, which can be written as Nj sigma Ij or Ji equal the Ti. This is for the uh, uh, natural boundary conditions or the essential boundary condition is going to be the Ui equal the Ui bar, where Bi stands for a prescribed value that located at the boundary as we are going to discuss. So all of these equations, nothing new. We just did a review. I've, I've done this review just to collect all of these equations and we're supposed to use all of these equations to solve some of the fundamental problems that we experience in, in different engineering applications as I just mentioned. Uh, but before we go deeply and we consider one example here, let us discuss something very important re related to the, it is commonly known as the inverse equations or the field equations. So let us discuss here the field equation. Equation. So to explain to you what does it mean a field equation, let us do some, you know, substitutions here. Like if we started, uh, if we just substituted this equation of the strain, let us work with the strain in the index notation. Let us substitute this equation of the strain into the, the, the constitutive equation. Just substitute epsilon with this form into this constitutive equation. So, and let's see what, what we're going to end up with here. So, sigma, we already have epsilon. 
we already have epsilon i j equals one over two times the u i comma j plus the u j comma i, right? This is equation one, this is the strain field. And we already have the sigma i j, which is the stress field according to the constitutive equation, it should equal to the ep lambda epsilon r r delta i j plus two mu epsilon i j, right? This is gonna be the second equation. So if we substituted one into equation two, we're gonna end up with this form like sigma i j is gonna be in, in this form, like epsilon, lambda epsilon r r, if you just put i j r r, this is gonna give us one over two u r comma r plus u r comma r, which indicate that if we sum these two together, we're gonna end up with u r comma r. So the epsilon r r becomes u r comma r, if you just plug as I mentioned. Like RR, this is gonna give us like one over two times the two UR comma R, this is gonna give us UR comma R. The delta IJ is still the same, plus the two mu epsilon IJ, which is gonna be like the one over two, just substitute for this one. So the one over two will be canceled with the two, right? So we're just gonna end up with just one mu times the UI comma J plus the UJ comma I. This is gonna give us the stress then let us substitute this, this stress into the equations of motion. So the equations of motion in the index notation, we got it in this form. So substitute into the equations of motion. So substitute into equations of motion or we can write like the equations of motion and the equation of motion is already in this form like j i comma j plus the fi equal the rho ui double dot. Assuming even that we're already working in a static as we used to, and, and as we agreed that this is gonna be the main focus of this course for the static case. So we're gonna have this equilibrium equation substituting into this equilibrium equation, sigma ij comma j, this is gonna give us the lambda u r comma r delta i j you can even start do it like step by step as i'm doing here u i comma j plus u j comma i all of this term is going to be like comma j right this is just sigma this is the entire sigma comma j plus if i equals zero for the static equilibrium make sense then you're just going to distribute because all of these are different terms we can distribute this derivative over these terms like this is like you're already doing derivative of this equation with respect to x or y or z so this simply is going to give us lambda u r comma r j delta i j plus the mu u i comma j j plus the u j comma i j Make sense? We're just gonna add one more derivative here plus if y if i equals zero. Then we can get rid of this delta. If we decided to get rid of this delta, it means that we have to use i and j, the same index for both i and j. It means that we just gonna use the lambda u r comma r i plus the mu times the u i comma j j plus the u j comma i j plus if i this is gonna give us the field equation. This equation is commonly known as the field equation or the Navier, Navier equation. Or the this is commonly known as the Lamy Navier equation. So as you can see that this field equation, or we can call this one as the field equations as we discussed. So the field equation, these are the equations that can be directly solved for the displacement. Because as we mentioned that, even if you're gonna look to this governing equation that we demonstrated up there, that we basically start from the displacement field, from the degree of freedom, from the displacement field. This degrees of freedom is commonly known, this is the displacement field equation. This is the displacement field. So we start by assuming a certain displacement field, and we plug into this canabarical variable. So if you don't have any continuum, and for some reason you don't have this displacement field function is already given, is already known, we we do have everything. We can directly substitute you into this strain field. 
we're going to end up with the strain component, the sixth component of the strain, then we can substitute into the equation of motion, we can end up with the body force or any other things that we are interested in. Also, we can form the strain energy density function, we can form the constitutive equation, we can do everything as long as we do have the displacement field, right? So, but basically, it doesn't work in this way. Like, initially, we assume or we give like an assumption of the displacement field, and we plug this, this assume displacement field into all of these governing equations, into these equations, and especially to form, we substitute into the equation of motion to form this field equation, Navier's equation. Then we have to solve this equation for the displacement field. Once we solve this equation, this equation is just three equations for three unknowns. Three equations for three unknowns, which are ux, ui, and uz. So we can simply solve this equation for the three displacement field components. Then we can form other things like stress strain as the way that we want using the other equations. Make sense? So this is the basic idea of the field equation, and this is the conventional thing. Like starting from the displacement field and form the strain, this stress, plug into the equation of motion, we're going to end up with this equation. In order to solve this equation, as you can see, this equation, for example, if we assume one-dimensional case for one-dimensional problem, it means that we do have only ux. There is no ui, there is no uz. So we're going to end up with only one equation for this, for this case. Then if we decided to solve this equation, this equation will be differential equation. So let us assume here, let us assume one-dimensional four. One-dimensional dimensional elastic problems. One dimensional elastic problem, it means that this means, this means that we do have ux, it should be with a value, and we are seeking this value of the ux for a given force, if I already acting or force acting on the object, but the ui and the uz both are zeros. For it working two-dimensional problem, you're going to have like a displacement along x, a displacement along y. If we're already working three-dimensional, it means that there is a possibility for the particle that is located inside the continuum to move along x, y, and z. So this is like three-dimensional elastic problem. One-dimensional elastic problem, it means that the particle inside the continuum, it can only move in unidirectional way, on one only one direction, like x or y or z. Like assume that we have just x, ux, and plug this ux into this equation. And just let us assume, write the three equation. So we won't gonna have three equation because we're gonna have here, we need just one equation because this is single degree of freedom. This is single degree of freedom system. So we need only one equation, equation of motion. Make sense? So, or one field equation. So what should be this field equation? Definitely I, it's gonna be X because we're already working as UI. If you remember that from the equations, we started defining the degrees of freedom or the, as UI. So as long as I, it is X, it means that any I in any of these equations should be X. Make sense? So doing so here for this field equation, UI, X, I is gonna be X. So you're just gonna substitute for i equal x into the field equation. So into the field equation, we're gonna end up with this form. Like we're gonna have the lambda u r comma r, just a dummy index, and you do have here i, which is gonna be x, plus the mu times the u i, which it should be u x comma j j, plus the u j comma i is gonna be x j, plus the f x, it should equal to zero. This should be the equation. As you can see, for this equation, we do have the r, we do have the j, both are dummy indices. It means that you have to repeat over them. We have to repeat over the j, we have to repeat over the r as well. Make sense? But if we decided to repeat over the R, we do have, we don't have, we can have here like, for example, this term, if we decided to split it into three terms, it will be like UX comma XX plus UY comma YX plus UZ comma ZX. X, but R, R is gonna be once XX, YY, and ZZ. This term, it should be zero. This should be zero. Why? Because u, y, u, z already zeros, right? So we're just going to end up with one term. This is going to give us here this equation like lambda 
ux, xx. Make sense? Plus, this is the, the first term, mu. For this one, we do have ux, comma. This ux, it would be function. This ux, it would be function of x only. It would be function of y only. It would be function of z. It would be function of the three directions or it would be only function of x. If it is already function of x, it's going to be one dimensional problem. It's going to be classified as one dimensional problem. So the one dimensional problem, it means that the displacement field components, they should be only dependent on one coordinate of the system that we're already considering. And for this case, in many of the cases, it's going to be only one component. Like this is single variable, one dimensional problem to be more accurate. So it is single variable. It means that we have ux, only one ux, and it is function of x. But it is not function of y, there is, it is not function of z, and the other component already zeros. So if doing so, ux, comma, if we substitute for this one as xx, we're going to find derivatives. But if we substitute for this j's by y, so there is no derivative with respect to y because it is not a function of y. Make sense? So this is going to give us just ux, comma, x. It's going to give us the ux, comma, xx. Plus... This term, the j should be x because we don't have y or z, comma x, and the j should be x as well. Plus, if x is going to be 0, if we collect it all, as you can see, this ux, comma xx is a common factor, so we're going to end up with lambda plus 2 mu. This time, the ux, comma xx plus fx equals 0. So this is going to give us an equation. This equation, what is the job of this equation? This is ordinary differential equation that should be solved for the ux component. If you already given fx as a force, or it would be zero, this fx it would be zero with a value, it doesn't matter. We can, we're going to end up at the end with a first order, uh, with, with, I'm sorry, with a, a second order ODE, ordinary differential equation that should be solved for the ux and it is second order because we do have two double derivative here with respect to x. Make sense? But if we solve it, for example, assuming that, assuming, I just want to show you something here very quick. Assume that fx even zero. So we're going to end up with this equation, like ux comma xx is going to be zero. Because this is, if this term is zero, this term will be canceled or divided by this term. So this is going to give us zero. So solving this ODE, the ODE, we're going to end up, this is second order ODE, we're going to end up with ux with this form. It's going to be like C1x plus C2. Where C1 and C2, this C1 and C2 are two constants, are two constants that should be determined. So the question is how we can determine these two constants. We have to apply by applying applying the boundary conditions, applying the boundary conditions. So that's why in order to fully describe a displacement field, we have to have an idea about the boundary condition of the continuum itself. What's happening at the surface, at the external surface of the continuum body that we already considered to fully describe its displacement field or the displacement field of its component or any other fields, the strain field even, or any other fields that belong to the continuum, in many of the cases, we, ha we should have an idea about the boundary conditions. Why this boundary condition? Because we're going to end up with some ODEs, and in order to solve these ODEs, we're going to end up with some constants. We have to find values for this constant. The value of this constant depend on the boundary condition, and this boundary condition is going to be different from one problem to the other problem. So that's why it is important to know what does it mean a boundary condition and how we can define and understand these different boundary conditions and how we can apply them when we solve the ODEs or the field equation. So this is the basic idea. As, as you can see through this course, we were demonstrating things regarding the fundamentals of the continuum mechanics. We were discussing starting from the mechanics of particle and we drive it all of this equation and we explain them with more details. Now we just collecting these equations and these are the governing equations that we supposed to use them to solve some engineering application or some elasticity problems like problem that you would have a continuum body and this continuum body is subjected to some forces. So we would like to in, in, investigate its elastic behavior under the influence of these forces. This is the main objective. So we have to use these equations 
One of the approaches, for example, is just to form the field equation as I have formed this field equation the same way, then you're just gonna try to solve this equation. But to solve the equation, this is this field equation it is ordinary differential equation. So we have to apply some boundary conditions. Make sense? So now we're gonna discuss these different forms or different types of the boundary conditions that can be applied in the classical elasticity. So now let us discuss the boundary boundary conditions in classical elasticity. This boundary condition that I just wrote on the list of the governing equation up there. We do have two different types of the boundary conditions. We do have essential boundary condition or natural boundary condition. Just to explain to you what does it mean this boundary condition, let us consider here that you do have a surface. And this surface belongs to a continuum body, whatever this continuum body is, like assume that this is just a surface of any object. Just one surface. And for some reason, we're gonna subject this surface into this force along x-axis, assuming that this is x x, uh, x direction. So what's gonna happen to this surface? This surface is gonna be rigidly moved according to the classical elasticity, like you just moving this surface. The movement of this surface definitely will result in some deformation and some stresses and some strains inside the continuum. Forget about the thing that would happen inside the continuum bulk and just focus over the surface itself. What's gonna happen to the surface because of the external force? It will be rigidly moving, moving in the same direction of the force. And the displacement UX that this surface would exhibit, it will be dependent on the applied force. So I'm gonna consider that this thing, this is just a surface. You should understand that this is surface of the continuum. And this is like external force. This is like surface force, external force. And this U is gonna be U bar. Bar, it means that this is like displacement of the surface, which is different than the U, which is the displacement field inside the bulk. Here I'm talking about the displacement of the surface itself, right? Because of the external force. How about if we have the same continuum, even we don't have the same surface, we do have the same surface, but instead of moving or pushing the surface to move in this direction, we're gonna push the surface to move in the with another force. Like this is another force in this Y direction. So this surface definitely is gonna move in this Y direction with a displacement as UY. Rigidly move. It won't gonna rotate. Nothing would happen to this surface except it's just gonna move rigidly in the same direction of the applied force. Make sense? This is according to the classical mechanics or the classical elasticity because we do have advanced theories that would assume that this surface would be deformed. Because for example, for some reason, assuming that this surface it is too long surface, so, and we just pulling or stretching this surface or pushing or pulling this surface from one point. So we may experience, we may have this surface is gonna be bended a little bit. This bending that we would be and the surface, because of the external force, is negligible in the context of the classical elasticity. So if we do have a force, this force is going to stretch or moving the surface in the same direction of the force, and that's it. Make sense? How about if the surface it is subjected to a moment? And instead of force, we subject this one into a couple or a moment. So assuming that this is the continuum of body again, and this is the surface of the continuum, but this surface, it is subjected to a moment. Like assume that this is the axis or the center point or the center line of the continuum or this is the point of center of the surface itself. And for some reason, we're subjecting this surface into a moment in this way. If you remember from the continuum mechanics course, if we assume this direction, like this is x-axis and this is the y-axis, assuming these directions, so this moment is going to be the moment about the missing axis, which is mz. This is the moment about z-axis, which is the third direction, right? To give rotation to this surface. So this surface, because of the rotation, it will be, because of the moment, it will be rotated. It won't going to be just rigidly move as these cases, but it will rigidly rotate. This one, these surfaces will be moved, 
but this surface because of the moment will be rotating so it will rotate in this direction in this way so there should be an angle of rotation this is the previous axis now we're gonna have another axis so this is gonna give us like a rotation here so the angle of rotation is gonna be theta and this theta is gonna be theta z because this is rotation about z axis like you're already putting your finger in the z axis and giving rotation in this direction make sense so and even if you remember from as we discussed we defined before that the vector the rotation vector theta i it should equal to the negative of one over two epsilon i j k time the theta jk we already defined the rotation vector in terms of the rotation tensor and even if you remember that the rotation tensor sigma theta jk it should equal to the one over two the uj negative k uh, comma k negative uk comma i so generally speaking if we do have if we already subjecting the surface a surface into a moment this moment will produce a rotation into the surf this surface this rotation is just going to be an angle and this angle would be somehow related to the gradient of the displacement so the according to this equation the rotation it is related to the gradient of the displacement field it is not related to the displacement field itself but the force it will reduce displacement to the surface but the moment will produce a rotation to the surface and the rotation to the surface is related to the gradient of the displacement because we do have here u j comma k and we do have u k comma i it means uh, comma j it means that so what does it mean this it mean that the display the moment the rotation is related to the gradient of the displacement make sense it is related to the gradient of the displacement itself in case that this surface is going to be subjected into into a moment but if it is subjected to a force so will result into a displacement directly with no gradients to these displacements make sense so let us also consider another scenario here how about if we do have this is the continuum and let us focus over the surface of this continuum body this is going to be the surface and assume that this surface is pivoted this is this point it is a pivot this point point it is just pivot like a hinge make sense so what's going to happen and let us assume that we are going to subject this surface into two forces not just one force one uh, two loadings one force in this direction as fy plus it is subjected to moment as mz because assuming that this is x y direction assuming that this is x y direction Make sense? So what's going to happen to this surface? Do you think that this surface is going to move because of the force? We do have two uh, effects here. We do have two things acting over the surface. Forget about the moment for now and focus over the force. Because of the force, what we are expecting that this surface should be moving down with a displacement u y bar. u bar y. It should be with a value as long as there is no constraint over this surface to move along the y direction. But since there is a hinge, it means that it, it is fixed and this hinge allows only for the rotation of the surface and there is no possibility for this surface to move. So what does it mean for this case, the UY, the UY bar is gonna be zero. There is no displacement in the Y direction of this surface is possible in the Y direction because of this hinge. Or especially this point, it should its support. I'm talking about this point. The displacement of the pivot point will be zero, but the other displacements would be ha having a value, right? But the displacement of this point at the pivot is going to be zero. How about the moment? The moment it will result in some rotation about this pivoted point, right? So this is going to give like kind of rotation. So what does it mean for this case? We're going to have theta. Definitely, we're going to have theta of rotation like theta z. So we're going to have here theta z will be with a specific value as, I'm sorry, it should be with a value. It won't going to be zero for that case. How about if this surface is completely fixed? There is no hinge. There is no nothing. So if it is completely fixed, both the displacement and the theta both will be zeros. It means that there is no possibility for this surface to move or rotate. 
So for that case, we're going to consider that the theta and the displacement both, both are zeros. So these are very quick like a discussion. What does it mean a uh, boundary condition? So the boundary condition is to describe the nature of the forces and the displacement, forces acting on the surface and the displacement that would be result because of this force or the moment that acting on the surface and the rotation that would be result because of this moment acting on the surface. So this, this is the meaning of a boundary condition, is to describe these things, what's going to happen to the, to, to the surface because of the external force, because of the external moment, this is, can be described by the boundary conditions. In the classical elasticity, these are the assumption, the main assumption. There is no possibility for these surfaces to deform. They are only limited to move rigidly or rotate rigidly. There is no possibility for any surface, according to the classical elasticity, to deform. This is the boundary condition in the classical elasticity theory, and this is what we're going to consider in this course. Make sense? Last thing regarding the boundary condition, in general, we do have different types of boundary conditions. As you can see, there are the boundary at any surface. It is described by two things, force and displacement moment and rotation and rotation it is conjugate or related to the displacement gradient it means that it is related to the displacement the moment it is type of a force right so it means that the boundary condition it would have two forms or two cases it would be either force or it would be either or it would be displacement like and both these should be related together so but the boundary could the thing that would be acting over the surface it would be a force or displacement so what does it mean for example I can give a force, I would act over this surface with a force, definitely this force will result in some displacement in the surface, but we don't know how much is the value of this displacement. The force is the one that is given to us. This is an option. The other option that you may have the value of ux, but we don't have the value of the fx. So for this surface, if we subject the surface into a force, we're going to end up with a result, with a displacement. Or if we push the surface at displacement, it is, looks like you're already acting on the surface with a force. So both are related. So if you know one, one of them, if, you, if we know the value of fx, we, should, we can come up with the value of ux bar. If we knew the value of ux bar, we can come up with the value of fx. So if having one, you can, you can end up with the other one from the elasticity and solving the equation, and this is what we're going to do. Make sense? So it means that one of these two different forms of the boundary conditions is enough to describe the boundary and the nature or what's going to happen to this surface, either a force or a displacement. If the boundary condition it is given as a force, this is known as natural boundary condition. But if the boundary condition is described or at a surface, or what's going to happen to the surface is described by a displacement, this indicate essential boundary condition. This type of boundary condition is known as essential boundary condition. Like you already putting a constraint over this surface to move just three millimeters. So this is essential boundary condition. I don't know how much of the force acting over the surface, or even there would be no forces acting over the surface, but I'm putting a constraint over this surface to move along X axis, three millimeter, three millimeter, this is displacement. So I'm defining, I'm putting a constraint over this surface through a displacement. This is essential boundary condition. But if I put a constraint over the surface that it should be able to support a force with 10 Newton. So this, we're already defining the boundary condition in terms of a force or even in terms of a moment. This is natural boundary condition. Make sense? So the boundary conditions in general, it would be either essential or or, uh, bound, uh, or natural boundary condition. And based on the type of the boundary condition, we can define the type of the boundary, boundary value problem. What is the boundary value problem? I'm pretty sure that you had an experience about this type of problem before in the mathematics class. Boundary value problem, it means that you do have for this course, like we're going to have a continuum and this continuum is already bounded with a specific defined boundary and these boundaries would be subjected into some prescribed displacement 
like we gonna put a constraint over the surface to move along X with a certain displacement, or even it would be subjected to some forces or moments. So if we'd have such type of elastic body and we would like to solve this problem or this elastic body, we have to drive the equations. When we drive the equation of the displacement field, we're gonna end up with this field equation will be differential, uh, ordinary differential equation or partial differential equation in general, differential equation. And in order to solve these differential equations, we're gonna end up with some constants in the general solution. And to come up with this constants, we have to apply some boundary conditions. So we have to have information about the boundaries of this continuum bodies, what they are. To solve this continuum body and find its displacement, you have to solve, mathematically speaking, you have to solve a boundary value problem. So what is the boundary value problem? This is the mathematics. This is the problem that should be solved in order to describe the elasticity of a continuum body with a specific boundary. A continuum body with a specific boundary is known as bounded elastic domain. Bounded, it means it has boundary and this boundary already defined in terms of either natural boundary condition or essential boundary condition. So the boundary value problem, it can be grouped into three types. We do have type one boundary condition, type one boundary value problem for this one, all the boundary conditions or boundary conditions are essentials, are essential boundary condition. What does it mean essential boundary condition? All the boundary conditions are described by the displacement. Essential boundary condition, it means that the, the descri described by the displacements. Like this surface, I'm gonna put a constraint over this surface to move one millimeter. And this surface is gonna move two millimeter. This surface is gonna move four millimeter. So what's gonna happen to the continuum in general? What is the new configuration? What, what about the strain? What about the stresses? If we put these constraints over the surfaces, what's gonna happen to the entire continuum? What's gonna happen to the entire material? This is, to, to figure it out, we have to solve boundary value problem of the type one. Why? Because all the boundary conditions are essential ones. The type two boundary conditions or boundary value problem type two, this is for the case that all boundary conditions or boundary conditions are natural boundary conditions, are natural boundary conditions. Natural boundary condition, it means that all the surfaces are subjected to forces or moments. So for example, I'm giving you a continuum and this surface is gonna be subjected to a force of 10 kN and this surface is subjected to a force of 20 kN and this surface is subjected to a moment of 10, uh, 10 Newton times mirror. So what about, how about the, how much of the strain, the stress is generated within the continuum, the deformation of the continuum, study the elasticity of this continuum under these natural boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions, the things, that affect over, or the constraint that we put over the surface, it is in the form of a force. So this is commonly known as natural boundary condition, and this is the boundary value problem that should be solved with, is gonna be of the type, uh, type two. Type three is gonna be like mixture, like it's gonna be hybrid one. This is like the mixture between, like boundary conditions are mixed one. Boundary conditions are mixed. So you're gonna have like essential, some of the boundary conditions will be essential boundary condition and some others of the boundary condition will be natural boundary conditions. Make sense? This is the type three and this is very common and we may experience some engineering application that we may have only type one or type two or type three. It depends on the boundary value problem. And to solve this problem, you have to solve for the differential equation. It means that you have to work mathematics. This is the basic idea of the, uh, of the boundary uh, value problem, and this is the thing that we're gonna do. Make sense? So what we're gonna do now is, I'm just gonna give you an example or two examples of boundary value problems that four elastic continua in the one dimensional case. Like the continuum is gonna be only having one variable and this variable it is function of one dimension. Like it is a function of X, a function of Y and so on. So we're gonna end up with ordinary differential equation. Then we have to solve this ordinary differential equation by applying some boundary condition. So we're gonna consider two examples 
of these boundary value problems in the one dimension, the next meeting or the next video, we're going to discuss the, uh, the two dimensional case. So we're going to move. This is how we're going to proceed through this course. This is the way that we can continue the rest of the time for this course. It's going to be this way, like considering multiple or different forms of the boundary value problem, and we're going to study how we can solve them. All right, so let us consider this first example of a long bar under the ten uh, under tension. This is very typically the same like the sample tensile test. This is what happens in case that we're already preparing a sample for a tensile test. And remember that here we're just going to consider this sample under the uniform tensile stress, which is sigma zero, uh, in the elastic zone, like it is still in the elasticity. You know that in the tensile test that we stretch the material to the fracture, it means that we're going to have elastic, then we're going to bring the material to the plastic deformation or the plastic behavior. We won't going to move to the plastic, the, to the plastic thing, but instead we're just going to uh, work in the elasticity since this is the objective of this car. So within the elastic zone, how about if we have this bar and this bar is subjected into a, a uniform stress at sigma zero. At the free end, how about the stresses or let us figure out the displacement field of any point that belongs to this part, how much it is. And even we're going to try to drive the same simple equation that we used to have in the mechanics of material class or even that we are that we knew from the simple tensile test so let us start with the assumption because any model whatever it is it it is based on certain assumptions so the main assumptions here and this is the first thing of this model that initially that we are assuming that l the first main assumption that l divided by d it, it is too large, bigger, too way bigger than one. So what does it mean? It means that L, which is the length of this bar, D, this is the diameter of this bar, this is the bar diameter, that the L over D is too large. It means that the length it is too big in comparison to the diameter. It means that this is like very thin bar in comparison to the length. And for that case, we're already stretching this bar. So what does it, another assumption is that this bar is a uniform bar. It is uniform long bar. So when we said that it is uniform, uniform it, in, it means that the diameter is fixed, the diameter is the same. Long bar indicates that L over D it is bigger than one. So it means that this indicates that it is a long bar. But if it is a short bar, it means that L over D will be comparable and the analysis will be different and even the uh, the equations and everything will be different in case that we're already dealing with a short bar. But for long bar, under this condition, there are some assumptions or something that we can consider here. In addition, we can assume that it is a small deformation. What does it mean, a small deformation? It means that for a small deformation, it means that we can assume that this material is linear, elastic, elastic material, that this bar is made of linear elastic material, and the small deformation, it means uh, a small deformation. It means that the uh, we can work with linear elasticity. Small deformation. It means that we can work work with we can apply linear linear elasticity. Linear elasticity in uh, 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 like like the other because if it is not a small deformation, it is large deformation. We can have nonlinearity, but this nonlinearity won't gonna come through the material. It is not just through ge the geometry itself. And for this case, we're going to have like, like for example, we discussed this thing when we were discussing the constitutive equation and the strain energy density function. If we're already having a large deformation, the strain energy density function will be dependent on high, the higher order terms. If you remember that for the linear elasticity, we neglected the higher order terms for the strain energy density function. But if we already working in large deformation, we have to consider them 
for uh, and this is and this source of the, the nonlinearity and in this case we're going to end up with some nonlinearity and the nonlinearity will be due to the geometry of this bar itself but this is not the case we're just going to assuming that this stress will provide some elastic deformation in the material and this deformation it is not that significant it is still small so we can work with the concept of the linear elasticity and this is our main objective of this course in the meanwhile that the material is linear elastic material that the bar of made of linear elastic material also the material it is isotropic material isotropic material so these are all of these are different the essential assumptions that we gonna consider when we solve this problem if there are some of these assumptions are not applicable here or change it we are we gonna end up with a different problem and we're gonna treating different thing so long here indicate long bar indicate that this ratio is too big ratio way bigger than one it me indicating that for the long bar, there is an essential thing that we can assume. Based on this assumption, we can assume the following displacement field. And this is the first thing. For any problem, for any elastic problem, try to stick to the procedure that I'm doing here. We start basically by assuming uh, the displacement or forming the displacement field for this problem based on these assumptions. Make sense? So, as long as this bar, it is long bar, this L in comparison to D, it is too big. Generally speaking, if we, can, if we consider any bar, whatever it is, and this bar is subjected to some stresses or some forces, stretches, I mean. So, any material, any, if we pick a particle inside this bar, this particle should be moving in along X and it would move along Y. Also, it's going to move along Z if we're already working in the three dimension. But based on this assumption, we can neglect the effect of some of these displacements in comparison to the other. And we're going to reduce the number of degrees of freedom from three to one or two. It depends on these assumptions that we're already considering for this bar. Make sense? So generally, in, in the continuum mechanics, and this is what we introduced in, in the beginning of in this class, that as long as we're already working in continuum mechanics, in the classical mechanics, we would have three degrees of freedom for any particle that located inside the continuum of this part or this continuum uh, inside the continuum or, or the elastic domain. So according to the assumption that we'd have a long bar, forget, forget about even it is a long bar. So what do you expect of a point or a particle that is located inside this bar when it is stretched? Let me explain it to you with more detail. How about if we made this bar a little bit short? Like this is the original bar. Without exposing this bar to any, it is short bar. This is the length. And this is, assume that this is short bar. This is the length L. And this is the diameter D. Of this bar, cylindrical bar. But it is short. This is just short bar. This is just short bar. Okay, assume that this is short bar. So if we try to stretch this bar or subject this bar into some forces or stresses, typically the same like this problem, but the only difference that this is long bar, this is short bar. So what's gonna happen if we stretch this one? Definitely the length is going to increase a little bit. Right, and what's gonna happen to the diameter? The diameter is gonna be shortened. Like the diameter thing, it will be shortened. And in addition, as long as this one is, this portion, it is fixed, even if this, we're already fixing this surface, right? This surface is fixed. So if we try to figure out, so what does it mean this surface is, is fixed? It means that this point is fixed point, this point is fixed, it won't gonna move. The, there is no displacement for, for any point that belong to this surface. So this surface will be fixed, the same one. But this surface will be stretched, will be moving. So because of the movement of this surface and since the volume is constant, we're gonna end up with the deformed shape in this way. And it's gonna be curved somehow next to the fixed end. It's gonna become like kind of curved, right? Why? Because we're going to keep these surfaces or these points as they are in comparison to the other point. So if we choose one point, let us pick one point here. 
This point under this kind of deformation because of the external force, it will not be moving only along X. It's gonna move along X plus it's gonna move along Y direction. And this is gonna be very clear, for example, for this point. As you can see this point, it was here. Now it moved here, right? So it moved this point or moved up to, the, uh, up to this point. So this point moved in this X direction and moved in the Y direction generally, right? And definitely it's gonna move even in the third direction because we have the Z direction. So there should be like U, Z direction. So the short bar problem, it is in general three dimensional problem. But if we assume that this bar it is long bar and the length here is too much big in comparison to the diameter. So for this assumption, we can, if we try to compare the displacement along X to the displacement along Y or Z, you're gonna find that the displacement along X is much way bigger than the displacement along Z than the displacement along Y. Or in other words, we're gonna, it should be to be more accurate, like the displacement along X, it is much way bigger than the displacement along Y or Z. So if under this assumption, under, and this would happen on, and in case that this is a long bar, that the length is too much bigger than the diameter. So for this case, we're gonna have only, that is fine if we assume that we do have only one type of displacement as UX neglecting the displacement along Y and Z. Why? Because they are exactly, physically, really, re in, in the real case, in the reality, it is already smaller than or very negligible in comparison to the UX. This is as long as we do have a long bar, but for the short bar, no, we won't gonna take, we cannot assume this thing and we have to deal with this problem as three dimensional problem. But now we're gonna deal with this problem as a one dimensional problem. This is one dimensional problem. But this problem is a 3D problem. More complicated problem for sure, but this one is more simple to handle and deal with this one. Although there should be, you should understand that there should be UY and UZ still there, but they are very negligible in comparison to the UX. So to make the calculation and the mathematics and the analysis more simple, that is fine if we neglected the effect of UY and UZ. Even if you consider them and you spent effort and you spent time solving the three-dimensional version of the long bar problem, you're gonna end up with almost the same results. So there is no need to waste time considering other degrees of freedom, which are very negligible. And that is fine to assume that we do have only UX for this special type of problem. But if we're already working over short bar, we have to consider or deal with this problem as a three dimensional problem. Make sense? So now we, in this example, we already consider long bar under uniform tension. Long bar, it means that that is fine to assume that we do have UX and neglect the UY and UZ. So for that reason, that is fine to assume that we do have the UX as a displacement and the displacement field along Y is gonna be zero and the displacement uh, field along Z is gonna be zero. That is fine to assume that. Make sense? But how about the displacement along X? It's gonna be function of X or function of X and Y and Z because we are already working in the three dimension, assuming that this is the X axis direction. And definitely this is gonna be the Y axis and the third direction is gonna be the Z axis. So how about the displacement of this particle along X? Is it gonna be function of X only, or is it gonna be function of X and Y and Z? What does it mean that it is function of X? Function of X, it means that you're gonna ask yourself to investigate whatever it is function of X or not, Ask yourself, is the displacement of a particle located at this point, is the same displacement at a particle located at this point or this point or any other point? No, it's gonna be different. So what does it mean this? This indicates that you, the displacement of this particle along X, it is dependent on its location, where it is gonna be located over X, so it should be function of X. And a proof of that, if I ask you what is the displacement of this point along X, how much it is? It should be zero. Why? It is fixed point. But how about the displacement of this point? It will have a value and significant value. But how about the displacement here? It's gonna be lower. 
So as you can see, the maximum displacement, and we knew these things from the mechanics of material class, that the maximum displacement of the point that located here, it's going to be maximum, and this displacement is going to decrease to be zero at the fixed end. Make sense? So what, this, what does it mean? This, this indicates that the displacement ux is already a function of x. Is it function of y or not? Is it dependent on y, on, on y or not? This is going to be, if we consider the short case, the short bar, for the short bar, basically, definitely, the displacement along x or even though along, along y or z will be dependent on the location, where the location of this point with respect to the y-axis or even the z-axis. Why? And this what explain this curvature near or next to the fixed end. This curvature, these points here, for example, like this point here, do you think that this point will have a displacement along y? No, but this point will have a displacement along y. This point will have another displacement along y direction. It means that the displacement of the point, the displacement field of this point will be dependent on the y coordinates. But this is not the case in the long bar. In the long bar, we may have a little bit curvature here, like this case, but it is very negligible. Why? The bar is too long. So this effect is very negligible. So that is fine to assume that this UX, which is the unique or the individual displacement field that we already have, which is UX, we don't have any UY or UZ as we assume for the long bar, that is fine to assume that this ux it is function of x and it is not a function of y or z. Why? Because the lateral displacement or the dependence, it means that the displacement of any point here, the ux of this point, in comparison to the ux of this point or this point or this point will be the same. It is independent, does not depend on the y coordinate. So for this case, that is fine to assume that we do have unique or single ux degree of freedom which is ux and this ux is just a function of x it is not a function of y it is not a function of z how much what is the expression of ux we don't know this is the thing that we are solving for we have to form a model we have to form an equation then we can solve this equation for the ux to find this displacement field for this bar problem make sense and this is what we're going to do so these are the assumptions and based on the assumption we Form the displacement field. Remember that this displacement field that we assumed here will be different if something in this assumption had been changed, especially if we're already dealing with short bar. Short bar, it means that this is going to be a three-dimensional problem and you're going to have, it's going to be much way complicated problem. And for that case, for this type of problem, it is recommended to use a software and to solve this problem analytically, it's going to be kind of hard thing. So for the short bar, we're going to consider like we have ux and uy and uz and the three components will be dependent of the three axes. You're going to find ux is a function of x, y, and z. The same thing uy is a function of x, y, and z and the same thing for uz. But for the long bar, this is going to be the shape or the form of the, we can assume this displacement field to proceed with. Once we form the displacement field, even if you remember the list of the governing equation that we listed up there, then what comes next before, after the degrees of freedom or the displacement field is the strain field itself or the kinematical variable. So we're going to form here the strain field according to the given displacement field that we assume. There is not given. We form in this displacement field. So the strain field equation, the epsilon, equation epsilon ij it should equal to the one over j, over two ui comma j plus uj comma i this is the strain equation right and remember that we do have only epsilon uxx if you tried all the six components because this is strain it is six component we you just gonna find only one component that we gonna end up with will have a value for the strain field which is gonna be the ux comma x the epsilon xx is going to be ux comma x. If you try epsilon yy, it's going to be uy comma y, which is definitely zero. Epsilon zz it will be uz comma z. Epsilon xy, epsilon xy, if you try, for example, epsilon xy, it's going to be one over two. ux comma y plus uy comma x, right? ux comma y is going to be zero. Why? Because it is not a function of y. And uy comma x will be zero as well because uy, it is already zero. If you try epsilon xz so it's gonna be one over two ux comma z plus uz comma x 
This one will be zero. It is not a function of Z. UZ is already zero, right? So we're going to end up that all the components will be zeros except one string component, which is UX comma X. Make sense? You can try all of them. So we're going to end up with just single component of the string, which is this epsilon or XL string in this case. Make sense? Once we form the strain field, we can form the stress field, or we can apply the constitutive equations to come up with the stress, uh, the stress field. And this is going to be the third thing here, forming the stress field. The stress field. This can be formed by applying the constitutive, constitutive equations. Remember that the objective here is just to find an expression for this ux. We assume this function, we assume ux, but we don't know a specific expression for this ux, and we are interested in finding this vx, how much it is. So for the constitutive equation that as we wrote this one, it should be sigma ij, it should be epsilon, uh, uh, lambda epsilon rr, which is a dummy index, delta ij plus the two mu epsilon ij. Make sense? Then if you tried the different components, let us start with the sigma xx, how much it is. The sigma xx for the given epsilon xx would have only epsilon xx. There is no, the other component of the strength should be zeros. So I'm just going to write the, the expression. Epsilon, it should be lambda times epsilon xx plus epsilon yy plus epsilon zz. Why? Because this rr is a dummy index plus the two mu epsilon xx. This is the general expression for any problem in the three-dimensional case, in the general case for the sigma xx stress, the axial stress. But remember that this term is zero, this term is zero, based on the displacement, the string field that we formed up there, right? So we're just going to end up with one component or one term that includes the epsilon xx, right? So if we did so, it means that all of these components, or even just so we have these things already zero. So we're gonna end up with sigma xx is gonna be with this form as lambda plus two mu. We can collect this epsilon xx as a common factor. So this is the strain field, the axial strain field. How about the sigma yy? Do you think it is is it zero? No, it is not a zero. Form it. So it's gonna be lambda times the epsilon xx plus epsilon yy plus epsilon zz. This term. Is com it, it, it is the same for sigma x, x sigma y, y, and zz, plus this term is the thing that is going to change, epsilon y, y. This epsilon y, y is zero, this one is zero, this one is zero. So you're going to find that sigma y, y will be eps lambda times epsilon x, x. Make sense? The same thing is going to be for the sigma zz. If you repeat it for the sigma zz, it will be lambda times epsilon x, x. This is for sigma zz. But if you try it, for example, sigma xy, it should equal to the two mu epsilon xy, and definitely epsilon xy is going to be zero, so this sigma xy is going to be zero. It means that the other shear stresses, because this sigma xy is sigma xz, sigma z, these are the shear stresses, the other component of the shear stress will be zeros, but the normal component will be with the specific values, as we already got them here. This is for the stress field. Now we're going to move to the equi equilibrium equation. We're going to apply the equilibrium equations, the equilibrium equations. We're going to work on the static condition. So the equilibrium equation for the static condition, it should be sigma j i comma j plus f i, it should equal zero. Make sense? So let us write these equations. If we decided to write the three equations, the first equation is that sigma x x comma x plus the sigma yx comma y plus the sigma zx comma z plus fx equals zero. This is the first equation. You're going to find that this term is zero, this term is zero. Why these two terms are zero? Because there is no derivative with respect to y, there is no derivative with respect to z. This sigma xx, it is a function of epsilon xx, and epsilon xx, it is a function of ux, and ux, it is only a function of x. There is no y dependency for any one of these strain or stress components. So definitely, if we try to form even, if we don't have, we don't have even sigma xy or sigma xz, but even though if we don't have them, for this problem, since nothing, we don't have the displacement field, it is independent of the 
y coordinate or the z coordinate, so there is no derivative, so these terms will be zero. How about the body force for this problem? The body force, as we defined them before, it should be the type of the force that already acting on the particle located inside the core of this bar. Do you think that there is any forces acting on the core of this bar? No, there is nothing. There is no forces. This, this is stress, which would be, we're going to deal with this one like this is the force. Time divided by the area, the surface, the surface area, it's already acting over this particle that located over the surface of this bar. But the other particle inside, there is nothing acting on them. So it means that this indicates that the body force of this bar, it should be zero. Make sense? There is no body forces acting over the particle inside the core, so this term is going to be zero. This at the end going to give us the sigma x, x, comma x equals zero. This is going to give us the first equation, equilibrium equation. How about the second equation? Let us try to write the second equation. This is going to give us the sigma y, y, comma y, plus the sigma x, y, comma x, plus the sigma uh, z, y, comma z, plus the f, z equals zero. So, this term definitely is going to be zero. This term is zero because there is no sigma x, y. This term is zero. There is no x, y, z, sigma y, z, or even there is no dependency on the z axis. Also, this term is going to be zero for one reason, that there is no y. There is no dependency on the y, and this term is going to be zero. It means that this equation is going to be cancelled, right? Or simply, if because in the second equation, let us... Let us assume that we are interested in finding the sigma y, y. So this term is going to be zero because there is no body forces as we explained. So we can write even the second equation. We can write the second equation in the form as zero equals zero. Or we can say that this is sigma y, y, comma y. It should be zero. So this is for the second equation. If we repeat the, th the same issue for the third equation, we're going to end up with a similar term. Sigma z, z, comma z equals zero. So as you can see, the three equations for this long bar, the three equilibrium equations, they are kind of identical. Like this is x, x, comma, x. This is y, y, comma, y, c, z, z, comma, z. These are the equations of motion. Now, if we decide we would like to form the field equation, the field equation, it means that we would like to form an equation. We would like to form an equation that this equation, it would include the stress, the, uh, I'm sorry, it would include the, uh, the displacement, an equation for the displacement field. Because remember that our main objective is just to find an equation for the displacement field, and this is what we're going to do. So, now let us form here the field equation. Field equation. So the field equation, it should be, Your objective is just to substitute for the strain and the displacement into the equations of motion that we just drive it. So we have to substitute here. Let us start to work over the first field equation, which is the sigma xx. So for the first equation, sigma xx, I remember one essential thing that you should understand. How many degrees of freedom do we have for this system? We have only one degree of freedom, which is ux. It means that we need only one equation. One equation is enough to form this system or to solve this system, to find this ux. But in the equilibrium equation, we got three equations. Yes, we got three equations. But the other two equations, we need only the first equation to solve for ux. And once we solve the ux, we're going to use the other two equations to come up with the stress fields, with the stress fields in the other directions. So the objective of the other two equations is just to form the strain, the stress fields in the lateral direction, in the y and z directions. But we're going to make use of the first equation only to solve for the displacement field. Because this is single degree freedom system, so we just need one equation, which is going to be the first one. So I'm going to use the first equation, and I'm going to substitute for this stress first. What is the sigma xx? We got it by the lambda plus 2 mu epsilon xx. So I'm just going to plug it this sigma xx into the first field equation or the equation equilibrium equation so we're going to end up with lambda plus 2 mu times epsilon xx comma x right because this is this term this term this is like the epsilon this term assume let us add 
square brackets here so this should be like comma x right like comma x this is gonna give us the the first term it should equal to zero this is gonna give us the first equation then with as we did we explained before we can add this derivative to all of this term these are material constant they are not dependent on the coordinates x but we do have a special type of material. We do have some types of the material like functionally graded material. This is one of the material types that it is artificial material that we are making this material. We can manufacture a material with its properties already dependent on the coordinate X. So what does it mean? It means that this lambda and mu, they also will be functions of X. So for that case, we, if we decided to apply the derivative, the derivative, this is going to give us two terms. One term that you're going to have a derivative for this lambda and mu, and another term, the derivative for epsilon. But as long as these things are for linear isotropic material, and this material are, these material parameters are constants, they are not dependent on the coordinates. It means that we are not dealing with a functionally graded material. So for this case, you can, that is fine to move this one outside the bracket. So we're gonna end up with lambda plus two mu as a common factor, then we're gonna end up with epsilon x, x comma x. Make sense? This should equal zero. So definitely, what does it mean this equals zero? It means that we can get rid of this term. We can cancel if we divide by the zero. So this is gonna give us the epsilon x, x. Gonna give us the epsilon x, x comma x. This equation equals zero. This equation it is differential equation. Very similar to the differential equation here, that the, to the ordinary differential equation like this one, right? Now let us substitute for the, for the displacement. We got epsilon x, x by u, x, comma, x. This is epsilon x, this is epsilon x, x. All of this should be comma, x, it should be zero. So simply we can write this one as u x comma x x. It's gonna be second derivative equal zero, and this is gonna give us the ODE that should be solved. This is the field equation that we have to solve it. Now we're gonna work mathematics. Your objective is just to solve this ODE. Now we're just gonna solve the ODE. Solving this ODE from the mathematics, this is second order derivative. So if we did integration to both sides twice, like let us do it once. So we can end up with u x comma x equals zero. I'm sorry, equals uh, equals uh, c one. Makes sense. If we did the integration just once, this is gonna give us u x comma x equals c one. Then let us do the integration one more time. Integrate one more time. This is gonna give us u x equals c one x plus C2. So this is gonna give us the general solution of this ODE, which is the field equation. Now we have these two constants, C1 and C2. How we can find them? We can find this constant by applying the boundary conditions, apply boundary conditions. So now let us talk about the boundary condition for this problem. But remember that how many boundary conditions do we need? We should have two boundary conditions. Why? We do have two constants. If you have three constants, you should have three boundary conditions. If you have 10 constants, you should have 10 boundary conditions and so on. So the number of boundary conditions that you need, it equals the number of constants that you're gonna end up with upon solving the ODE. And another interesting point that the number of boundary conditions that you need, it equals the number of the order of the derivatives of the variable that you're already solving for. This is second order derivative, so we need two boundary conditions. If this is third order derivative, we're gonna need three boundary conditions and so on. So what are these boundary conditions? As you can see, this bar, it has two boundaries, one at the fixed end, or one at x equals zero, and the other one at x equals L. Like what is the x coordinate of this point is gonna be zero, assuming that this is the x axis here, and this is the zero point. And what is the x component of this point is going to be L. So what is the specification of the surface, of this surface at x equals zero? Everything is dependent on x only. So what are the specification of this surface in terms of either the forces or the displacement? But which displacement ux? You'd have only one displacement ux. Do you think that this surface would move along X or Y? No, it won't gonna move, why? Because it is fixed. 
So it's UX, it should be zero. What are this, what is the specification of the displacement of this surface that what this thing with this surface from any other surface, even this one or any other location, what this thing with this surface from other that it's displacement, it should be zero. What about this surface? What this thing with this surface from others? That this surface is subjected to a stress, uniform stress, this is stress, it is constant of sigma zero. Uniform, it means that constant stress or constant force. But this is constant stress in this case. So it is subjected to a uniform stress, to a constant stress equals sigma zero. Sigma zero like it is a given number, given thing. So we're going to make use of these two boundary conditions. These are the two boundary conditions. The first one, when x equals zero, this is the first boundary condition, when x at x equals zero, at this surface, it's ux, it should be zero. There should be some forces there because there is support, so there should be reaction, right? But we have no clue how much is this reaction force. But if this reaction force is known, you can make use of it. But I don't need it. ux is enough at one support or what, what one end, one end of the bar. How about the other end of this bar? How about the other surface of the bar? At x equals L, at x equals L for this bar, you're gonna find that the sigma xx, this is the stress, the axial stress it should equal to sigma zero. Make sense? Because at the other bar, it is not subjected to force. It is not, the surface, it is not movable. It means that there is the specification of this surface, it is described by a stress. It is subjected to a stress. How much of this is stress? It is sigma zero, it is constant, which is sigma xx. Because this is the axial stress. Someone would say that, okay, we don't have sigma y y and sigma z z, yes. But the sigma xx, it is directed parallel. This is normal stress parallel to x. It means that it is conjugate to sigma xx. It is related to sigma xx. It is not related to either sigma yy or sigma zz. So what does it mean? It means that sigma xx, this is the second boundary condition. And using these two boundary conditions, we're going to find C C1 and C2. So let us apply, for example, let us start with even the first or the second boundary condition. But to form this boundary condition in terms of ux, we have to find sigma xx how much it is in terms of for this function. So if we substitute ux into this equation, into this equation, we should end up with the sigma xx in terms of c1 and c2. We would like to find sigma xx, which is this one, in terms of c1 and c2. So sigma xx, I'm just going to rewrite again this equation, this one. I do have sigma xx, which it should equal to the lambda plus two mu times epsilon xx, it should equal sigma zero, right? This is according to this boundary condition. And so I, and this one is already ux comma x. So how much is ux comma x from this expression? This is gonna give me c2, uh, c1, I'm sorry. If you, uh, the, the, the x derivative, this term will be zero, this term will be c1. So this definitely is gonna be just c1. So substituting, we're going to end up that C lambda plus 2 mu C1 equals sigma 0. This is according to this second boundary condition. Make sense? So how much is C1? Can we find C1? Yes, simply su substituting here, we're going to find value or expression for C1. For this one, we're going to end up that C1 is going to be sigma 0 over lambda plus 2 mu. This is going to give us the C1. So we got one constant. How about the second one? So we made use of this boundary condition. We got C1. How about the second boundary condition? We have to use this one. At x equals zero, it means that if we substitute x equals zero into this expression, we should end up with ux with this value, which it should be zero. So the ux of x equals zero equals the C1 times zero plus C2. So this term will be canceled it should equal to z equal zero according to this boundary condition. So this is going to give us from here, we're going to conclude that C2 is going to be zero. So these are the two constants. We got them. Now, if you plug them here, you're going to end up with the ux function. And this is going to give us the displacement that we were seeking. So this is going to give us at the end, the ux will be C1. We got it by sigma zero over 
the two, I'm sorry, the lambda plus two mu times the x. This is the, uh, and remember, C2 is already zero. This is the ux. If I ask you how, how much is the epsilon xx, epsilon xx, it should be the ux comma x. If you differentiate this one with respect to x, this is going to give us sigma zero divided by two lambda two mu. As you can see, epsilon xx, it is uniform strain, uniform constant strain. It won't going to be dependent over x. Even if I ask you to find sigma xx, how much it is? It, this sigma xx, according to the equation, it should be lambda times plus two mu epsilon xx, and we got epsilon xx, which is going to give us sigma zero. It means that this bar is subjected to uniform stress, and this is what we assume, or this is the main assumption that, or the main feature of this bar, that it is subjected to a uniform stress. Uniform stress, it means that this sigma xx, it is, sigma zero it is fixed at any point. Like the stress here is gonna be sigma zero, the stress there, sigma zero, is fixed at the same stress at any point that belongs to this bar. Make sense? And this problem, this type of problem is very similar to the simple tensile test. And we can even form the Hooke's law. Can we find the Hooke's law? Of this equation, the Hooke's law states that we knew th these things from the uh, mechanics of material that sigma xx should equal to E, which is the Young's modulus, which is the slope of the stress strain curve in the elastic region, times epsilon xx. So if we com compare this form, this one, to this one, we're going to conclude this is like E star. This is like an equivalent Young's modulus. This equivalent Young's modulus is going to be the lambda plus 2 mu as already given. If you just compare this expression to this one, you're going to end up that this E star, which is the equivalent, this is like equivalent elastic modulus. Elastic modulus of the material. So someone would think that we are during the tensile test. The Young's model that we are measuring, it is not the pure Young's models. This is actually, it should be the lambda plus two mu. It should be the lambda plus two mu. And this is gonna give us the, like an equivalent Young's modulus of the tensile test or the material that we already using. How about the Poisson's ratio? If we remember that the Poisson's ratio from the mechanics of material, it should be, or how about, let us figure out the, the lateral stresses, which sigma yy and sigma zz. Sigma yy we, and sigma zz, we got both of them are equal of the same value. Sigma yy, sigma zz, both are equal, equal lambda epsilon xx. And according to these two equations, according to this equation, sigma yy should be constant should be constant value, right? If you integrate, you're gonna end up with C1, C10, whatever, like any constant. And the same thing for sigma ZZ, it's gonna be constant, right? So let us demonstrate that these sigmas are already constant. Yes, they are constant because according to sigma YY and, Ips, and, and, and sigma ZZ, they should equal to the lambda epsilon YY, epsilon XX. So this is gonna give us sigma YY equals sigma ZZ equal to the lambda times epsilon xx, which is gonna give us lambda divided by epsilon xx, we got it by sigma zero divided by this time. So this is gonna give us lambda plus two mu in the denominator sigma zero. Remember that all of these terms are constant. So this indicate that sigma yy, sigma zz are constant according to the equilibrium equation. So we are in a good shape. There is nothing bad regarding these equations. Make sense? Also, an interesting point that you could understand about this term, like this lambda divided by lambda plus nu. If you remember, if let us explain this term in terms of E and nu. So lambda should be lambda, if you remember, it should be, it equals the nu times E divided by one plus nu divided by one negative two nu, right? And the mu, it should equal to the E divided by two times one plus nu. So plugging these things into this expression, so we're gonna end up with lambda over lambda plus two mu. If you just try it, you're gonna find it. So this is gonna give us nu over one negative nu. 
So where this new, this is the Poisson's ratio. So if we block these things up there, so we're gonna end up that sigma yy -Y equals sigma zz equal the new over the one negative new times sigma zero. So this is how the even the lateral stresses, the transverse stresses, sigma y y sigma y y sigma z z would be related to the applied stress. It means that if we try to stretch the material, the bar with sigma zero, there should be definitely some stresses that would be affecting on the lateral direction, on the transverse direction, in the y and z directions. As long as there is a Poisson's ratio for this material. So, but in many of the practical applications, even, and this is what we basically assume in the tensile test. In the tensile test, we are neglecting the effect of the, of the Poisson's ratio. In the tensile test, when we test the material, we didn't ask how much the, how much the, uh, the Poisson's ratio. So if we're neglecting, neglecting, neglecting the Poisson's ratio effect, effect it means that assuming that new equals zero if you plug new equals zero into all of these expressions starting from this one lambda plus two mu uh, two mu lambda plus two mu this is gonna give us just e if we substitute it this e star will be e and this is gonna give us the hook slow so e star will be equal to e if you just plug this lambda and mu into this expression lambda plus two new mu, this is gonna give us just E, which is the Young's modulus. And the sigma from this case, we're gonna end up that sigma xx equals E, which is the Young's modulus times epsilon xx. This is the conventional, the classical Hooke's law that we assume in the simple tensile test. And in the meanwhile, we gonna end up that sigma yy and sigma zz, they're gonna be zeros. It means that, what does it mean that you neglect the Poisson's ratio effect? This indirectly means that you neglect the effect of the transverse stresses that would be generated because of the uniform stress. You are just neglecting these stresses and the, these stresses basically depend on the Poisson's ratio of the material. If the material has negligible Poisson's ratios, so these stresses will be very negligible for that case. Make sense? It means that this would give an idea that the material that can be tested using the simple tensile test, it is recommended to test a material with a very negligible Poisson's ratio to end up with the exact Poisson's ratio, Young's modulus of the material from the tensile test. When we test the material, we can come up with the exact Young's modulus as long as the Poisson's ratio is negligible. But if we do, if we're already testing a material, in the simple tensile test, and this material, it has it has a, 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 a significant Poisson's ratio, or the Poisson's ratio is a big deal. So in this case, the Young's modulus that we're gonna measure, it will not be the pure Young's modulus, and instead it's gonna be the lambda plus two mu. Incorporating the Poisson's ratio effects will be embedded inside this effective Young's modulus or equivalent Young's modulus that we measure by the tensile test. Make sense? So. For this example, we consider one of the simplest problems that we experienced before in the mechanics of material class, even in the tensile test or any other engineering application before that you hadn't experienced before. But we consider this problem from in the context of the linear elasticity using the equation that we already explained through this course. Make sense? So that's it for this video. The next video, so what we did here, we did like, like a revision. Over, uh, over the main essential equations and we introduced for the boundary value problem for the linear elasticity problems. And we knew how we can solve, this is like a general procedure, how we can solve, starting from long bar under tension example, we solve this one with more detail till we end up with the displacement field, with the strain field, the stresses, and we convert this example even to the simple tensile test. This is the one of the practical engineering problem that we considered before, make sense? The next video, I'm gonna consider one more example or some more examples on the one-dimensional elast linear elastic problems, also two-dimensional linear elastic problem. This is what we're gonna continue covering in the next videos. All right, thank you and see you in the next video.